Okay. In verse one, <laughs> this is the main point of the things they're saying. Well, first we have a uh, such a high priest. That's Jesus, of course. Is seated at the right hand, right hand of something. We'll get to that. Number three is of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So that's the throne of God the Father. This he's seated at the right hand. <clears throat> uh, and in verse two, the fourth item, he's number uh uh, for he's the minister, but not minister like we would normally think of it. He's the minister, that's the high priest of the new covenant. He's a minister of the sanctuary, that's the, the heavenly sanctuary, most holy place. And uh, of the uh, number five, number, uh, the true tabernacle, that's the church. And these are heavenly, it's a heavenly sanctuary and a heavenly tabernacle. <clears throat> and the sixth thing that the things that he's saying is uh, the Lord directed this. This is not a, a, a configuration or a imagination of man. It was something that the Lord devised, directed, and put into place. So it says in the uh, it alludes to Hebrew, the 10th chapter, verses 11 through 13. It's, and it says there, and we'll get to it probably next week. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. And the uh, priest of the uh, Levitical priesthood, all the offerings, daily offerings and of course, the uh, Day of Atonement, all that, all that could never take away sins. But this man, this Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, it never had to be repeated. <clears throat> he sat down at the right hand of God. That's the uh, right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. From that time, waiting till his en enemies are made his footstool, and that would be at the uh, end of time, when it, all this is brought to a close. <clears throat> In verse uh, two, it talks about the uh, uh, so just a moment, we got some more people coming in. Here at uh, this verse, one and two, what he's emphasizing is that the church uh, maintains the same relationship to heaven that the uh, holy place of the uh, did to the most holy. <clears throat> of course, church and heaven are spiritual places and holy place and the most holy are of the uh, temporal tabernacle. The only way to heaven, of course, is through the church. And the only place to the most holy of the earthly tabernacle was through the holy place. So the holy place of the tabernacle had the ordinances corresponding with ordinances of the church. And it'd be very interesting. We won't do it now is to, is to <clears throat> specify which ordinances of the, the uh, Tabernacle uh, had corresponded with the ordinances of the church. <clears throat> the church is compared in Acts 15, chapter verses 16 and 17 to a booth or tent. That uh, booth or tent is large enough to accommodate both Jews and, and, and Gentiles. They both could find shelter in that tent or booth. <clears throat> in uh, First, First Corinthians three sixteen. It says there that we are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us. And in the sixteenth verse of chapter six of Second Corinthians, it talks about, again about the temple, us. What that, what does it have to do with uh, idols? Say so we're the temples of the living God. 
said, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verses uh, 19 through 22, said we're no longer strangers and foreigners, but we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In 1 Timothy 3.15, it talks about there, you know, Paul talking to Timothy, is writing him so that he may know how to conduct himself in the, the house of God, which is the church, uh, believing God, pillar and ground of the truth. And of course, we know that the uh, uh, church didn't begin until Pentecost, that's uh, 50 days after his resurrection. In Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verse three, says, for every high priest is appointed off for both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, Christ, have something to offer. <clears throat> you know, the priest, when they went in to make sacrifices, they had to, they had to bring something. They had to offer something. They couldn't just go in uh, just to, you know, it, it wasn't a stroll. It, they had to actually be doing something. <clears throat> but Christ didn't have any uh, animals or anything like that to offer for our sins. The only thing he had to, to offer was himself. So Christ is a priest in the uh, heavenly, the archetypal uh, sanctuary you know, the archetype. The old sanctuary was a type, and he's, he's the, uh, the priest in the heavenly uh, antitype. He says uh, <clears throat> in verse one and two, he's talking about one and two, there is no priest without uh, some sacrificial function. All the, the uh, priest of the Levitical uh, priesthood had some sort of function. In the temple, you couldn't just go there, uh, you know, without some something to do. But if Christ were here on earth, he couldn't be a priest at all. And the audience knew that. That's in verse four now, where there are priests already uh, uh, to serve the typical and shadowy sanctuary. They had priests there. And that's verse five. We'll get to that in a moment. The, the priestly functions of Christ, uh, therefore, must be discharged in a higher sphere. And so it was. It was that way. A priest must offer sacrifice. Christ is a priest, not a Levitical priesthood. But he's a priest, therefore he had to have something to offer. But he couldn't offer anything on earth. Therefore it had to be in heaven. That's where he had to make the offer. But unlike the Levitical priesthood, he doesn't offer a sacrifice time after time after time. Uh, you know, the Levitical sacrifices didn't do away with sin. But he offered at one time a continual offering, which was the only means to uh, procure our salvation. And of course, we know that the uh, sacrifice of animals could not accomplish that. Only Christ could do that. <clears throat> it says in verse four, for if he were on earth, he could not be a, he would not be a priest. He wasn't from the Levitical tribe of Levi, couldn't be a priest. He's from the tribe of Judah. Since they are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. <clears throat> and we always have to keep in mind that this epistle is being addressed to real people. And likely it was the Hebrew Christians. They're real. Uh, they had problems. And the writer of the epistle was addressing those problems. But if they're, they were, in fact, Hebrews, Hebrew Christians, it's very likely they understood this point about 
Jesus not being able to be a priest under the Levitical system. He was not of the tribe of Levi, the house of Aaron. Therefore, he couldn't be a priest to officiate in the, in the temple. Now that uh, priesthood, Levitical priesthood, and the law under which it operated was abolished when Christ was crucified. That is, when he was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. The church uh, became the heavenly temple. Why then uh, was the Jerusalem temple and the Levitical priesthood allowed to continue to operate? And it did, or at least for 50 days, and longer than that. It wasn't eventually destroyed until AD 70. Well, there's a reason God never just abruptly changes uh, these things. It was uh, for practical reasons that the law of Moses was allowed to continue because it was the civil law of the land. It couldn't be just taken away uh, in an instant. But it was eventually taken away in 8070. And it, it could no longer at that point in time compete with the, uh, the uh, Christian religion. It, it couldn't do it. <clears throat> in verse 5, it says... <clears throat> Uh, talking about the uh, Levitical priests, they serve the copy in the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses, Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. <clears throat> Where he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, I have a little comment to make about that. The tabernacle of the uh, the wilderness and the Jerusalem temples that were only ever intended to be a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. <clears throat> Since it was just a representation of the heavenly temple to come, Moses was divinely instructed to make all things according to the heavenly pattern because it was it, it was to portend the coming of the, the uh, permanent uh, temple. So it's very important to make all things exactly as uh, he was instructed to do. <clears throat> so we shouldn't think of the church, and I'm speaking of the present day church as uh, brick and mortar, because it's not. You know, we always say that we're going to church. Well, we, we're going to a meeting of the, of the church. Now, the local church in spring meets in the spring building, but the building is not the church. The uh, church, the divine institution, is composed of all those saved souls, whether meeting here or elsewhere, or here before departed. Now, keep in mind when we we talk about the uh, <clears throat> Levitical priesthood and the the uh, temple of the old law, the mosaic of the economy, and so forth. Keep in mind, that was all made according to the pattern. The pattern came from God, so it was a creation of God. So it was perfect for what it was intended for. But it was always to be a copy and a shadow. Now, if you think about just religions, uh, you know, the old law, the old temple, the old tabernacle, uh, it wasn't the substance of the uh, permanent that the church is. If you look at uh, all the major religions of today, the they are also a copy and a shadow. But of what? They're a copy and a shadow of a copy and a shadow. They never move from being a shadow. There is no substance on the uh, other side of the shadow. But there is for the uh, mosaical system, and that's the church. So we need to keep that in mind. You know, that's a huge difference between all these pagan religions. And uh, you can name about any religion. It's a pagan religion because it's not the religion of our Lord and Savior. But it's, they're all shadows of shadows. 
where is the old tabernacle? It's a shadow of the, the substance, the real substance, substance of the church. <clears throat> and that church, of course, is in the uh, heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians 1 3. Every spiritual blessing is in the heavenly places. And in Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 6, talks about there that uh, we're made alive together in Christ. And he raised us up together and we'll sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews 9, 23, which we'll get to uh, uh, maybe next week. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be uh, purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And we'll get more into that later. <clears throat> in verses uh, 6 to 13 of this chapter, you know, uh, to six to the end of the chapter, uh, the writer talks about the superiority of the uh, new covenant. It says, in verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, and that's more excellent than the uh, Levitical priest, in as much as he is the, also a mediator, and a mediator is a, a go-between. It's a compound uh, Greek word, it means middle and, and to go, go the middle. <clears throat> he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. <clears throat> His ministry is better because the new covenant is better than the old covenant. <clears throat> Moses was a mediator of the uh, old covenant. <clears throat> and in uh, Vine's ex expository dictionary, talking about the mediator, he says there that the salvation of men necessitated that the mediator should himself possess the nature and attributes of him towards whom he acts and should likewise participate in the nature of those for whom he acts. Uh, sin apart, of course. <clears throat> Only by being possessed both of deity and humanity could he comprehend the, the claims of the one uh, and the needs of the other. Further, the claims and needs could be met only by one who, himself being proved sinless, would offer himself as an exp expiatory sacrifice on behalf of men. That's from Vine's uh, Spiratory Dictionary. <clears throat> In Galatians uh, 3, uh, First, uh, chapter 3, verse 19 20, it says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions to the seed should come. So he's always intended to be uh, uh, provisional to whom the promise was made. It was appointed for angels by the hand of a mediator between uh, God and Israel. And now a mediator does not mediate for one only. There must be two parties. There must be two parties for there to be a mediator. But God is one. <clears throat> uh, in giving the promise to Abraham, there is one, only one party, God. So uh, there's an exception to the uh, two parties. It says in First uh, Timothy verses uh, chapter two, verse five, for so there's one God and one mediator between God and man, men, the man. Christ Jesus. In verse 7 it says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Now the old covenant was uh, perfect for what it was designed to do, and we sh should never forget that. It was a, a God-given covenant, so it was perfect for what it was designed to do. Uh, to do. But he can never justify, sanctify, or save anyone. In uh, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. 
for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So it was uh, a perfect law for what it was designed to do, but it was always intended to be uh, provisional. In Galatians, the second chapter, verse 16, so knowing that man, a man is not justified by the works of the law, the law couldn't, couldn't justify, but by faith in Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh uh, shall be justified. And again, in Galatians, in the third chapter, verse 11 says, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So, so the law could never do what the uh, gospel could do. Uh, one that was designed to be provisionary, provisional, the other designed to be permanent. In verse eight, it says, because finding fault with them, <clears throat> You know, they didn't keep the old covenant. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And by including both of them, Israel and Judah, he's really saying by implication with everybody, there's going to be a new covenant uh, with a new people. In Jeremiah the 31st, chapter verses 31 through 34 that's where it uh, says this it says behold the days are coming says the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah all people not according to the covenant i made with their fathers in the day that i took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of egypt that's the old covenant my covenant which they broke they didn't keep it though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the old law, says the Lord. I will put my law in their, their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Well, I thought the Israelites were, uh, he was God of the Israelites, and the, uh, he was God, he was their people. Well, he was, but... Uh, the uh, relationship was changed at that time. If you were a Jew, you were uh, part of a subject to the law. That's not the way it is now. Now, uh, each individual must come to the realization that he is responsible to God for his uh, own behavior and for his obedience. And it's by that obedience that he will uh, be saved. It says 34, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for well, they all shall, shall know me. Uh, those that are Christians, they will all know him. For the least of them, for the greatest of them, says the Lord. And for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember uh, no more. It the uh, idea here is that in the last days, that is under the reign of Christ, God will would complete and bestow upon the houses of Israel and Judah, and again by implication, that's everyone, uh, the new covenant or arrangement, which was re really intended from the beginning to be the permanent covenant. The old was never intended to be permanent. They knew the better one was. In the ninth verse of chapter eight, it says, continuing the idea of chapter eight, uh, verse eight, not according to the covenant, that, that's the covenant made on Mount Sinai, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and lead them out of the hand, land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them says the Lord and we get in here into the uh, justice of God you know the, the very nature of God is a God of justice 
Now, he made a covenant with them, certain promises of that covenant, but they didn't keep the covenant. And they continually violated it. And because God is a God of justice, that's his very nature, it was necessary then for him to reject them. And he did. In verse uh, 10, it says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. The first uh, point he makes is, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And the second thing, this is repetitive of what he's already said, and I will make, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the writer here uh, is, is going to set forth the points of difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the superiority of the New Testament over the Old. Uh, the Old Testament, first point, the Old Testament was uh, carnally external. And the uh, New Testament was uh, spiritually internal. The Old was uh, written on stone tablets. The New is written in the heart. Uh, one was a member of the old by right of birth. But under the new, he is begotten by the spirit, the word of truth, seed of the kingdom. So, therefore, unless one obeys from the heart, he cannot be a member of the new. Under the old, idolatry was mixed with worship of God, and there, there was uh, sometimes there just complete idolatry. And after captivity uh, they got rid of the adultery but then they began a hypocritical uh, letter worship uh, that is you're going to call it form of, over substance but under the new this is not possible since no one can become a member except by faith and obedience and continue as a member cannot continue as a member except on the same conditions so the big difference between the old and the new. In verse 11, they continue the, the uh, differences there. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the greatest, uh, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Again, repetitive for emphasis sake. No one ignorant of God can be a member of the church. So that's the saved. You can't be saved with it being ignorant of God. And in order to be a, a, a faithful member, one must be proactive. And we'll get into that in, in chapter 11. You know, the, the those of faith. In the 12th verse of chapter 8, and again, it's repeated again in chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. So we'll cover that again. It says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now, the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. That's, that's something the uh, blood of bulls and goats could not do. Those who are justified through faith uh, have no more should, should have no more consciousness of their past sins. In Colossians uh, first chapter verse fourteen, it says there, in, "In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins." And in First John the first chapter verse seven and nine, seven through nine, it says there, "But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son." cleanses us from all sin. Sin's gone, cleansed away. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And once that happens, there is no more remembrance of uh, sin. He says, again, verse 12, I remember that I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And there's a second part. There's uh, 
sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, verse 25, says there, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. He's a God of justice, so uh, those sins have to be uh, blotted out and not remembered anymore. In verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This uh, term, a new covenant, of course, implies that there is an old. Uh, but more than that, uh, logically, a new covenant can't exist while the old covenant remains. The new makes the old obsolete. That is, it's, the old is just not useful to accomplish redemption by the blood of Christ. It would uh, vanish away. There's going to be a very short time from the time this was written. Again, I'll just say 65 or 80, 65. Very short time that will disappear in 80, 70. Uh, that event effectively ended the, the old law tabernacle service and the influence of the Judaizers who threatened Christians, especially uh, throughout uh, Jerusalem and Palestine. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. And in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So that's the permanent. So from here forth, the, uh, the writer uh, proceeds to demonstrate uh, more fully and particularly the superiority of Christ's ministry in sacrifice. And it, he, does, he starts here at the verse 1 of chapter 9. He goes all the way to the uh, 18th uh, verse of chapter 10 to, to uh, make this demonstration of the superiority of Christ's ministry <clears throat> in sacrifice. <clears throat> in uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 9, you, you might uh, uh, he picks up again. He, he left off in the sixth verse of chapter eight, but he picks it up again here where he's comparing the, uh, the two covenants. Uh, the first covenant, of course, was of divine origin. And the sanctuary set up there and it was according to the pattern shown by shown to Moses by God. So it was it was divine in uh, origin. But it says in verse one, then indeed, even the first covenant, <clears throat> Uh, I might just mention that the covenant, the word covenant is not in the Greek. It's a catalyzed in New King James Version and it's parenthetical in the ASV. Uh, based on context, however, it could mean nothing else but a covenant. So the first covenant had ordinances. That's uh, requirements of the ritual law. Uh, might just also mention that here, uh, verse 10 and, and Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 6, only, are the only times that the Greek word is translated ordinances. <clears throat> and it says the ordinances of divine service and the earthly, that is worldly, uh, that's what the King James says. And of this world, which is ASV says. But it's the same idea, the earthly uh, sanctuary, the world sanctuary, this this world sanctuary. It's all same, really the same thing. But this earthly sanctuary, is, it's opposed uh, to the heavenly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary uh, was perishable. 
but the heavenly sanctuary is not perishable. Uh, it is a building, a house not made with hands, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 that we uh, read a moment ago. In verse 2 of chapter 9, the author now describes the furniture of the earthly tabernacle. And if you want to get more into that, you can look at the, the 26th chapter of, of Exodus. It says, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, by the way. Uh, it says for a tabernacle, that's a, a type of a, a church. A tabernacle was prepared. The first part, well, that's the holy place, and that'd be the church in which was the uh, lampstand. And the lampstand is a means of dispensing light. So we're talking about dispensing the light of the gospel. You might look at the Ephesians 5, 8. It says there, for you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of, children of light. You might also look at uh, Zechariah, the fourth chapter, the first 14 verses of the fourth chapter. We're not going to go there though it was the oil that actually produced the light you put the oil in the lampstand and, and lit the uh, that may have a wick or something and you lit that and that's what produced the light <clears throat> but there's also the table and the showbread uh, that's the bread of life the, that's the spiritual food of christians which is called the uh, sanctuary the holy place and asv <clears throat> in verse uh, 3 of chapter 9, and behind the second veil, uh, the part, uh, that's the second part as opposed to the first part of, of the uh, preceding verse, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, that's heaven. In verse 4, it says, which had the golden censer. And we would liken that to the, uh, you know, it gave out a, they would light the censer and smoke would rise. And that's uh, uh, like the prayers of the saints. ASV has the altar of incense. It says, in the Ark of the Covenant, uh, along with the mercy seat, that's uh, symbolic of God's throne. Overlaid on all sides with uh, gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the uh, covenant. In verse 5, it says, And above it were the cherubim, and that would be the angels that were sent to minister to the heirs of salvation the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail and many of these items uh, had been lost over the centuries so they they couldn't speak of them in detail because they couldn't you know the, the high priest couldn't look at these things because some of the things just weren't there anymore starting with uh, verse 6 uh, through 10 we see the symbolic services of the tabernacle and its insufficiencies. But since we're right at the bottom of the hour, I think I'll defer starting uh, this section until next week. So we'll, we'll end it here.